Good morning and welcome to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. My name is Bill Benson. I am the host of the museum's public program, First Person. Thank you for joining us today. We are in our 17th year of the First Person program, and our first person today is Mr. Stephen Fendes, who we shall meet shortly. This 2016 season of First Person is made possible by the generosity of the Lewis Franklin Smith Foundation with additional funding from the Arlene and Daniel Fisher Foundation and the Helena Rubinstein Foundation. We are grateful for their support. First Person is a series of conversations with survivors of the Holocaust who share with us their firsthand accounts of their experience during the Holocaust. Each of our first person guests serve as a volunteer here at this museum. Our, our program will continue twice weekly through mid-August. The museum's website, listed on the back of your program, provides information about each of our upcoming first person guests. Anyone interested in keeping in touch with the museum and its programs can complete the Stay Connected card in your program or speak with a museum representative at the back of the theater. In doing so, you will receive an electronic copy of Steve Fendis' biography so that you can remember and share his testimony after you leave here today. Steve will share with us his first person account of his experience during the Holocaust and as a survivor for about 45 minutes. If time allows toward the end of our program, we'll have an opportunity for you to ask some questions. Today's program will be live streamed on the museum's website. This means people will be joining the program via a link from the museum's website and watching with us today from across the country and around the world. A recording of this program will be made available on the museum's website. And we invite those of you who are here today in the auditorium to also join us on the web when the rest of our programs in April and early May will be live streamed. Please visit the First Person website listed on the back of your program for more details. For our web audience, if you would like to use Twitter to ask a question, send a picture, or write a comment during the program, please feel, feel free to do so using hashtag USHMM. The life stories of Holocaust survivors transcend the decades. What you are about to hear from Steve is one individual's account of the Holocaust. We have prepared a brief slide presentation to help with his introduction. We begin with his portrait taken in 1940 or 1941 of Steve Fendis and his sister Estera. Steve was born on June 6, 1931 in Subotica, Yugoslavia. The arrow on this map of Yugoslavia in 1933 points to Subotica. Steve's father, Louis, was the manager of the printing plant of a Hungarian language daily newspaper and would later become the editor of that same newspaper. His mother, Claire, was a graphic artist. In this photo, we see Louis and Claire at a horse race in Subotica in the 1920s. In this photo, we see Steve and his family on an outing to a farm in the summer of 1940. In 1941, Germany attacked Yugoslavia and its ally, Hungary, occupied Steve's town. Life changed immediately for Steve and his family. Jews in Subotica were subjected to Hungarian racial laws, which were modeled after those in Germany. From September 1940 to May 1944, Steve's family lived in one corner of their apartment. In May 1944, Germany occupied Hungary and Hungarian occupied territories like Subotica. Soon after, Steve's father was deported to Auschwitz, while the rest of the family was forced into a ghetto in Subotica. At the end of June 1944, Steve and some of his family members were sent to another ghetto and then to Auschwitz. Here we see an aerial reconnaissance photo of Auschwitz-Birkenau taken in September 1944 by the U.S. Air Force. The arrow points to the barrack that Steve was in from June to October 1944. In October 1944, Steve was sent to another camp at Nieder Orschel. On April 1st, 1945, Steve was sent on a death march to the Buchenwald concentration camp. This photo shows forced laborers at Buchenwald concentration camp. Steve was liberated by the Americans on April 11th, 71 years ago this coming Monday. He was placed in a field hospital established at Buchenwald, which is seen in this photo. Four months later, 
Steve returned to Subatitsa and was reunited with his father and his sister, but his father died less than six months after returning to Subatitsa. Steve's mother perished at Auschwitz. Steve and his sister immigrated to the United States in 1950. After arriving in the U.S. in 1950, Steve was drafted into the United States Army in 1952. After his discharge, he enrolled at the Champaign-Urbana campus of the University of Illinois, where he would eventually earn his Ph.D. in civil engineering and begin a 42-year academic career in the computing field at the University of Illinois and later at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. After retiring from Carnegie Mellon in 1999, Steve and his wife Norma, whom he married in 1955, moved to the Washington, D.C. area, where he worked for 10 years at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Steve and Norma have four children. Gregory is president of the University of Texas at Austin. Carol is special assistant to the New York City Commissioner of the Department of Design and Construction. Peter is a professor of literature at Northwestern University, and their youngest, Laura, is a human resources consultant here in the Washington, D.C. area. Steve and Norma have seven grandchildren between the ages of eight and 30, and I'm pleased to say Norma is right here in the front row with Steve. Steve first began speaking about his Holocaust experience in the late 1970s when he became the founding president of a Holocaust survivors organization in Pittsburgh. Upon his second retirement from the National Institute of Standards and Technology in December 2009, Steve became active with this museum. In addition to participating in our first person program, he also volunteers the museum's visitor services on Thursdays. In 2014, Steve published The Life and Art of Clara Garib, 1897 to 1944, a book about his mother, a graphic artist who perished in Auschwitz and her work that was rescued by a former cook during the deportations. Steve's granddaughter, Hannah, a graphic artist herself, was the designer of the book. Copies of Steve's books are available from Amazon. And with that, I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming our first person, Mr. Steve Ventis. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, so much. Steve, thank you so much for joining us and for being willing to be our first person today. We have a large crowd and you yep. have a huge amount to tell us in a very short period right. of time, so we'll start. Okay. You were nearly 10 years old when the part of Yugoslavia where you were occupied, where you lived, was occupied by Hungary and your family's life would be forever changed. Before we turn to that time, Let's begin with you telling us a little bit about your family, your community, and yourself in those, those years before the occupation, before the war. All right. Well, before that, let, I point this out every time I speak here. I taught for 42 years. I never had ushers who ushered people to the front rows, so my students always sat in the back rows. <laughs> this, is, this is quite a change for me. Uh, all right. Uh, we lived in this town, which uh, only became, uh, uh, Yugoslavia as a country is only 12, was only 12 years older than I was. It was only founded after World War I. Uh, and before that, it was part of Hungary, second large, third largest city in Hungary. Uh, very large agricultural center. Became a border town and it was never as lively as what my parents talked about from before the war. 100,000 people, Jewish population about 6,000, uh, 4,000 belonging to the uh, progressive con congregation, 2,000 belonging to a number of small uh, uh, Orthodox congregations. Uh, we were not particularly religious. My parents attended uh, uh, high holidays, festivals, uh, anniversaries, etc. Uh, we, my sister and I and our three cousins attended religious school uh, three afternoons a week and then uh, uh, youth service on Saturday mornings because the regular school went till noon on Saturdays so the community organized a uh, religious school for, you know, for children in the afternoon 
which had to end at promptly at two o'clock because at, that was the time when the three movie houses in the city opened the matinees and of course everybody ran out of the, uh, of the small chapel as fast as they could. Uh, uh, the fact that in school we studied in Serbian and at home we spoke Hungarian was, I mean, that was the normal thing to do. And that never bothered me, bothered us. It was strange when my children started school and they spoke the same language in school as, as we did at home for a while, that bothered me. So we had a very pleasant upper middle class life. And uh, uh, there was talk about the war. There were people coming in from uh, uh, refugees from uh, Poland uh, starting in 39, et cetera. But uh, nobody was really prepared for what happened and it came all of a sudden. Steve, before we turn to those years, tell us a little bit about your father. My father uh, was the younger brother. His older brother uh, became interested in literature in high school. Class his classmate was later known as the greatest Hungarian writer of the first quarter of the century. Uh, so they, they together founded a school newspaper, etc. Uh, my, when my uncle graduated from high school, he immediately went to Budapest ostensibly to study law. In fact, uh, he spent most of his time as a journalist. Uh, there are even uh, revisionist reports that his, uh, that he never graduated. Everybody called him Dr. Fenves, but apparently he didn't, never <laughs> took his law degree. And came back and started as a, a newspaperman uh, with a very sizable dowry from my aunt. When he married my aunt, he bought the paper. And as soon as my, as soon as my father graduated from high school, he went to Croatia, worked in Croatia to support his brother as soon as they could afford it, he came back as the manager of the plant. So my, my father uh, was very interested in uh, all of the activities of the, of the newspaper, uh, very much interested in, the, uh, in his people. Uh, I remember many times going, it, it, for some reason that I don't understand, a number of retirees opened up little uh, wine and beer shops with, with some food on the side. I remember going there for tasting and every one of them accompanying my father. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, and, and particularly the, the uh, Serb or I mean Orthodox employees had these fantastic uh, annual feasts for the patron saint of the, of the family and we always went to all of those. So uh, we felt very close to the people uh, and uh, uh, how, how about your mother, Steve? She was a very talented artist. My mother was a well-known artist. The local museum keeps advertising her as the first college, first university-trained uh, graphic artist in town. Uh, she did a lot of traveling before, uh, after school. Uh, the family lore is that uh, the two of them met by when she started doing uh, commercial work for the paper, at, uh, uh, et cetera, including the redesign of the, of the banner. Uh, she was not as active after we, we started growing up for the simple reason that the two of us outgrew the so-called so nursery mm -hmm. and barged into the so-called studio. And uh, uh, so that, that sort of curtailed her activities. I can't help but um, ask you to talk about this, but you mentioned to me that Wednesday afternoons oh, yeah, was yeah. a time off for maids and governesses. So that's yeah. when, when they all took some time off and that with your seven cousins, you would do terrible things. We had seven cousins in town, one in Budapest who occasionally came to visit, then we were eight. And I was the youngest of the eight. And, uh, it took years in school before I realized that my name was Fenvesh and not Kishvenvesh, which in one word means the little Fenves. I mean, <laughs> I thought that was my name. Uh, uh, so we were on our own, and we, whatever the older guys did, uh, guys and gals did, I followed. 
And so one, one incident that I'd mentioned uh, previously, uh, you know, in this economy with absolutely no refrigeration, no refrigerators, et cetera, you subsist during the winter on what you have canned and preserved during the summer. Well, one day we, brought, we, we broke into my grandmother's pantry, soaked off the labels of every jar and can in the pantry, and rehung them randomly on, on other. <laughs> so, so as you had as you'd said to me, and you just said a minute ago, those early years were pretty good years for yep. you. In 1941, Germany invaded Yugoslavia, and their ally, Hungary, Hung occupied yep. your part of Yugoslavia, right. where you lived. From the very first day of their occupation, your family and your community were immediately subjected to profound upheaval. What happened to your family once the Hungarians arrived? Uh, the second day of the, what the Hungarians referred to as liberation, we, we referred to as occupation, a armed army officer expelled my father at gunpoint from his office. Uh, as of about a month ago, I now have a copy of the order mm. of the commanding general uh, of the cessation, for the cessation of the newspaper. So my father and my aunt were thrown out, but well, not just that they were thrown out, uh, the plant was taken over by a uh, Aryan administrator who made it public be known that he intended to pauperize the family and did some nice things like uh, uh, a closing access to the bank, uh, to the personal account of my father and my aunt, at the same time charging the entire payroll of the plant to that personal account, and a few other things like that. So that's, that's how things went. Uh, we lived for the following three years on what possessions we could sell, uh, including my uh, uh, stamp collection that I was very proud of. Uh, half, eventually two-thirds of, of the apartment was, were ceded to uh, uh, army officers. So you had to have Hungarian army officers live in your uh, house yes, with you? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, there was no more nursery, there was no more studio, all of mm -hmm. that was was uh, uh, ceded to uh, officers. And what uh, this three years of, uh, of increasingly severe and restrictive and humiliating regulations. Every other month, something had to be turned in. Radios, et cetera, but eventually it was clocks, and alarm clocks, and stuff like that. Uh, long lines standing in, outside, people coming by and spitting at you. Uh, you know, it didn't make any sense, and we as kids had a, had a raffle going to guess uh, what was going to be the nec next confiscation in, in the next month. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what happened to your education during oh, that Oh, yeah, time? that speech right. of yours needs to be corrected. The Hungarian exclusionary law uh, called numerous clauses was copied by the Germans. It was promulgated in Hungary proper starting in 1923. Uh, setting the proportion of Jewish uh, students in academic institutions to the same proportion as, the, as in the general population, which was about 6%, called numerous clauses. Uh, academic education, of course, as elsewhere in Europe, started with fifth grade. That was the first year of the gymnasium. So that first summer of occupation, I had to study very hard to take this ruthless exam that was designed to kill you. And eventually I was one of nine who was accepted in. The uh, Jewish community set up a private school for the others. Uh, it didn't matter much because you sat in the back of the class, the, it totally ignored by, by the teachers. The, uh, raising your hand was, you learned, was not worth it because nobody ever called on you. Uh, so, uh, it was it's a very hard period. My mother, uh, as a uh, good, very good graphic artist, and actually her degree was in industrial design, uh, set up shop. A, a half a dozen of her relatives were knitting, crocheting, weaving, all kinds of things. Uh, and then that was shipped to Budapest where her cousins, 
could sell them at much better price than uh, you could in the small town. So her, her handicraft uh, really uh, helped, helped us survive. Was your sister able to continue her education? Uh, she went for a, she went to a, uh, the, there were several Catholic orders, some nuns, and a, uh, a teaching order called the Peerists, who did not honor the state law and accepted Jewish students. And she, she went to a uh, school run by, the, uh, run by a convent. And Steve, as you told us, your father was forced at gunpoint to leave his office. The newspaper was taken away from him. There would subsequently be a trial associated yep, right. with it. Uh, yep, yep. Uh, uh, all of this had to be legalized, of course, and in, in 1943 there was a trial uh, to, to make this legal. And uh, one incident I, I remember reading about, I don't remember, is that the accusation was made that it was a anti-Christian act that uh, they made uh, the workmen work on Sunday afternoons to bring out the Monday paper. They said your father made them do yeah, that. Yeah, my, my, well, my aunt was the manager by okay. that time. My father was the editor. Uh, and of course, the, the defense uh, statement that every other paper everywhere else in the world has a Monday edition, mm -hmm. which is produced on Sunday, the judge ruled ir irrelevant to, to this case. So that's, that's the kind of treatment mm -hmm. we got under law. And you would, as you said, live under those conditions in, until 1944. Right. And then in the spring of 1944, with Hungary about to capitulate to the Allies, yeah. Germany moved quickly to occupy Hungary and the areas it had occupied, including your town. Conditions for your family quickly turned far worse than under the Hungarians as your father was taken away and your mother, sister, and you were forced into a ghetto. Tell us what happened to your father and then what happened to you and the rest of your family? Well, my father, all the doctors, lawyers, the in Jewish intelligentsia in town was taken away in one night. Uh, as they, uh, Nazis did everywhere, uh, housed for a few weeks in a, in a uh, brickyard nearby and then shipped to Auschwitz. Uh, he eventually wound up <coughs> working in a, uh, coal mine in Silesia, and eventually was liberated. Uh, at his memoirs say he was about uh, among the 30 living out of a camp of 7,000. At the, at the time, did you have any idea where he no, went? No, 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 nobody ever knew. I mean, the biggest surprise a year later after my sister and I went back is that he came back on a, on a Soviet army uh, military train and the, local firemen brought him uh, off the train. And we'll talk maybe a little bit more about that later. Okay. Steve, you, um, you shared with me that it wasn't, um, it wasn't Germans that, that uh, rounded him up. Oh yes, every, uh, all, uh, I did not see a, a, a German soldier until uh, the arrival in Auschwitz. Uh, everything was done by the Hungarian uh, state police. They had uh, long ago planned all of that. Uh, many years later, Norma and I were in the Holocaust Museum in, in Budapest, and the entrance room is plastered with uh, facsimiles of, of newspapers of that time. And there, at eye level, as you enter, first page of one of the Budapest papers uh, describing the deportations from Subodica and the uh, orders of the commanding officer of everybody will be shot if anything happens, et cetera. I mean, I knew that everybody knew about it, but I never, I never knew that it was front page news. And Steve, after your father was deported, you and your uh, family were sent to a ghetto, but you, you remember the day that you were actually forced to leave your home, and you described it to me as one of your grimmest memories. Oh, the, uh, yep. Uh, uh, we were ordered to leave with whatever possessions we could carry. Uh, I don't know how the townspeople were uh, alerted, informed, etc. but uh, we lived on the second floor and the hallway, the landing, the stairs were lined with people waiting to uh, ransack the department as soon as we, we left. And these were neighbors? 
these, these were neighbors, these were local people. Uh, and as we were leaving, they were uh, yelling, cursing, spitting on us, uh, making it you know, difficult to navigate the stairs with, with carrying some baggage. Yeah, that was a uh, very tough day. But hidden, I mean, among those people was our former cook, whom of course we had let go three years earlier because I ate, we didn't have money, B, there was a rule that we did, couldn't have uh, Gentile uh, employees. Uh, she was in that group, she snuck in, took my mother's cookbook and took whatever uh, art on paper that she could find and shoved it in a big folder and took it with her and after the war returned it to us. And those of us who, those of you who are staying on this floor after this talk, go to the Somewhere Neighbors exhibit and there you'll see my mother's cookbook. Steve, you were forced into the ghetto. What, what were conditions like for you there? Oh, miserable. I mean, two, uh, two or more families in a room, uh, no sanitation, no uh, uh, food, uh, food distribution out in the court somehow. It just was total chaos, and I, I just remember kids, uh, us kids just running from, from place to place, and, and all of the wild rumors, uh, uh, you know, anything from uh, the, the, the revolt in town, and they're coming to liberate us, to whatever they you could, and there's a train waiting to take us to Switzerland. Every possible rumor was, was running around, and and then, Eventually, we were lined up and the trains, 80 people to a, to a boxcar, and these are European boxcars, and not the, the big American bo uh, uh, boxcars that you see, and 80 people crammed in there with one bucket, and that was it for, five, for what I estimate to have been uh, uh, five days and six nights before we arrived in Auschwitz. Before we turn to Auschwitz, um, in the midst of all those terrible conditions in the ghetto, you told me that you received a most welcome birthday gift on your 13th birthday. I was allowed out because I, I worked in a machine shop of a former employee, and I was out, out of the ghetto on my birthday, June 6, 1944, and we had, there we could, we had a clandestine Radio turned turn to BBC Europe, and that's how we found out that the Normandy invasion had started. And that evening when I went back to the ghetto, I, I suspect that I was the first person to notify people inside the ghetto that that had happened. I'm, I'm, you know, I don't have any documentation on that, but mm -hmm. very few people went, out, went outside the ghetto. So Steve, they rounded you up, they deported you in the boxcars to Auschwitz. Did you know where you were going? Nope, absolutely not. No. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know when the name came up. Uh, I mean, this, this certainly was not a standard rail, railroad siding with a uh, station name on it, but it was a horrendous experience. Uh, some of you may have sh seen uh, the film Schindler's List and may have seen, may remember the, uh, a scene where the, by mistake, the kids from the uh, labor camp are sent to Auschwitz, and uh, there's a nice, gently sloping ramp, and very gingerly and uh, uh, sedately, they walk down the ramp. Well, there was no ramp. There was a railroad car at, at, at my age, uh, height of my chin, and you either jumped or you were thrown out. And uh, guards as well as uh, inmates uh, detailed to, to empty the trains were very gladly glad to throw you out the, the train if you hesitated in jumping. Uh, men were separated from women. Uh, my uh, grandmother who, who had a prosthetic leg uh, which got lost somewhere was sitting on a bunch of uh, suitcases. Uh, my mother and sister went one way and I went the other way and that's, that's the last time I saw my, my mother. A uh, lot of Auschwitz survivors will tell you that they were selected by a, a SS doctor called Dr. Mengele. 
who did the selections, right? And like, I was not introduced to the gentleman, so I don't know his name. So it's just an officer with insignia of SS uh, uh, captain and white gloves, and he pointed right and left, uh, which none of us knew what, meant, what it meant. Take tw took 24 hours to find out. But where did your sister go? My sister and mother went uh, to, the, uh, to the right in their line, uh, but they were separated right away, so they were not together. Uh, so that's how I got to Auschwitz. Uh, Auschwitz is known as an extermination camp. 1.6 1, 1. million people died there, but it had a second function. It was an enormous stockyard you saw from the area of photograph where people were warehoused to be selected to go out to labor, to the kind of labor that you saw on the slide. The only problem was that in a barrack with about a thousand kids my age, uh, no German foreman, no German officer looking for labor ever stopped to select. Just a thousand kids. Just a thousand kids. And so you learn quickly, I mean you learn a lot in very short order, what the other line meant, what the stench meant, what the ashes falling down on you meant. Uh, you learned uh, to, until you could scrounge funds to get yourself a cup, you learned to take your daily uh, meal of soup in your hands on your once a day uh, run to the latrine, you learned to pick up a smooth pebble on the road to have something to wipe yourself since unfortunately they did not provide toilet paper. You learned uh, the stench of your own body after months of not washing, of not changing clothes or underwear. Those are the kind of things you learned. Uh, you also learn to volunteer in weird fashion. Uh, in this barrack, I mean, m many of you have seen movies from Sing Sing or uh, uh, criminal movies, and you know that in a criminal establishment, you fear two kinds of people, the guards on the inside and the uh, decision makers on the inside who are inmates in control. In Auschwitz and all the German camps, this was uh, organized, as everything was organized. The overseers called kapos were uh, German common criminals brought out from prisons to serve as overseers. So murderers and rapists and people like whatever, that. Whatever, whatever. So they, they only had one problem. They spoke only German and the majority of the kids, uh, or inmates in Auschwitz at that time spoke Hungarian. So one, th one thing about my childhood education that I didn't mention is that in my parents' social setting, it was absolutely imperative that my sister and I learned, learn perfect high German rather than the crude Swabian spoken on the streets and we had a German governess from any, any memory I have, the governess is already in it. So I volunteered as an interpreter. At age, age 14, right? Yeah, for 13. An interpreter. I, I was an interpreter, I became an interpreter. The rewards were minimal. One reward was that after the troops were fed from these uh, barrels, you could go and the two interpreters could go and with a spoon and scrape out the bottom of these barrels. But you learned a lot about the makeup of the camp, et cetera. Uh, you also learned that people die before their body gives out. That under these conditions of privation and starvation and hopelessness, uh, the mind and spirit dies before the body. And these people are shuffling around, uh, not seeing where they were going, 
totally oblivious of it. And eventually they were, some night, they were carted out with the, together with the dead and sent directly to the crematorium. No, no point in wasting gas on ga gassing them. They were already dead. Unfortunately, in this barrack, uh, boys were doing that. All of, one by one, uh, every one of my uh, classmates with whom I was together died in that fashion. I'm told from people who were with her that my mother died in that fashion. So you, you, were, you were able to locate your sister somehow. Oh yeah, and that came, that came later. Uh, so that, you know, they, people ask me about my feeling. I mean, at, at, during that period, I had no expectation whatsoever of being luckier than then and of surviving. The big event was in August, uh, very well documented in the Auschwitz literature. A quarter of this compound was, was the entire compound was called the, the gypsy compound because a quarter of them was occupied by gypsy families. Women, children, older men, no working age men. They were exterminated in one night. And we were locked in. Uh, and when, we, we, when the uh, gates, the barrack gates were open, we saw inmates uh, cleaning out the barracks, whitewashing them, et cetera. And we saw a new set of orderlies, a new set of supervisors. But instead of the green triangle of the criminals, they had red triangles of political prisoners. Uh, one of them came over and asked for a Polish, German, Hungarian interpreter. I've never heard a word of Polish in my life. All I knew that it was a Slavic language and therefore I decided it couldn't be much different from Serbian and I volunteered. Uh, that, that's the point that changed my life because these people, first of all, they were willing to train me in Polish because my uh, presumption that it was easy was not that uh, accurate. <laughs> uh, but these people were resisting and insisted that anyone who worked for them also resist in whatever fashion they could and they certainly expected that anybody working for them would expect to be able to survive through his actions and through his resistance. So the idea of survival, the idea of perhaps getting out of that is not, I didn't make it up, I, it was hammered into my, mm -hmm. my head by, uh, by these Polish couples. So lots of things happened. I was an interpreter. Uh, these German, uh, we had the troops lined up for inspection when they came. For reasons that I've never understood, every inspection was in the nude. When my sister was selected to work in a, in a, uh, uh, light, in a light bulb factory threading filaments, the inspection was among 400 nude women. Why that skill requires nudity, I never understood. Anyhow, people were lined up nude waiting for, for the inspectors. Uh, when the traffic was too heavy, uh, uh, those of us who were interpreters were sent to the, S uh, uh, the or, uh, SS station at the front of the camp, escorted the, the people looking, doing the translation while uh, they were looking uh, while they were interviewing the people, uh, you quickly learned to sort of doctor the responses. When, when they looked for, for carpenters, then any response anybody gave was translated as expert carpenter uh, to, to the German. Uh, so that was one of our duties. The other uh, duty the group had was uh, it had a roof repair detail. Uh, 
if you've been in the perm permanent exhibition, you see a, one of the barracks from Auschwitz, but you don't see the dilapidated condition and the foreign roofs, et cetera. So even the SS agreed that with the winter coming, uh, some repair needed to be done. So we were, we were given a, a uh, handheld car, a, a, a cart pulled by two people and containing a barrel of pitch and some rolls of, of uh, uh, roofing paper. And we went from compound to compound uh, uh, fixing roofs very frequently to women's compounds for the very simple reason that the Polish couples that uh, sort of rotated on this, uh, on this detail had their girlfriends as uh, cop f female couples in female uh, compounds. So visiting was, was part of it. Black marketing was another part of it. Uh, it's, it's really amazing to think how much, uh, 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 how much, uh, uh, how easy it was to bribe uh, the soldiers, e even uh, uh, non-commissioned SS officers. Steve, was it while you were doing the roofing that you were able to locate your sister? Yes, in one of the compounds, I located my sister. She was out on her way out to a transport. Uh, I cashed in all my black market goods and got, got her a, a scarf and set, sweater to get out with her. And, and then she left and so... She left, I, I left. And did you know where she was sent? No. Steve, we could, we could spend the entire yeah, afternoon right, right, with yeah, you yeah. just covering the five months that you spent in Auschwitz and we still wouldn't do it justice, but all right, all in, right. in a truly astounding way, you left Auschwitz yep. in October 1944. Tell us how that was possible uh, and what again, happened. Uh, the uh, Polish couples smuggled me out. There's no other word for it. Okay? Uh, decided on transport that looked reasonably safe. Uh, uh, they shoved me in the line uh, and, uh, and I got out. Uh, another train ride uh, just to cover it quickly before your questions. Another train ride arriving to the small town in, uh, in, uh, in Eastern Germany called Niederorschel. And we were assigned to a factory that was produce, producing Fokker Wolf, uh, wings for Fokker Wolf air airplanes. Uh, lest you think that we co-op, we are guilty of collaborating with the enemy, let me tell you that no wing produced by that factory ever flew. <laughs> there, there was enough shortage of pieces, there was enough uh, uh, sabotage, there was enough uh, disruption of the, of the railroad lines, etc. so nothing ever happened. Steve, before you go on, I do want you to tell us um, that, that when you left Auschwitz, when you got to, I, I believe it was Nieder yeah, or Shell, right. um, here you are, a 13-year-old interpreter, 13-year-old kid who just left Auschwitz, you weren't warmly greeted uh, by, the by the inmates. By warmly gre greeted by the foreman who recognized me as ha having translated for him in Auschwitz, but saying that, why are you here? I did not select you. Uh, to which I immediately coined the answer, well, they thought that with this many new people you needed an another translator. He accepted that. But the inmates did not. I was Foreman knew me, my clothes were better quality than the other inmates. Uh, it all sounded very strange, so I was very long interrogation uh, in German, Hungarian, uh, Russian, Czech, uh, whatever else, uh, before I was accepted by the leadership, by the resistance organization. And from then on, I was a part of that organization mm -hmm. as well. And Steve, uh, as, as you were telling us that you know you were supposed to be making wings, and, and and but no planes flew from there. You also were covertly making weapons, if I re remember right. Every, I mean, everything was punishable by death, as as right. always. Uh, we were constantly. I mean, whatever could be stolen from the factory was stolen. I mean, the, the word stealing did not appear in the inmate vocabulary. It's always liberated. We liberated what we could. Uh, 
<laughs> scrap aluminum, tools, whatever. Uh, after 14 hour workday, the so-called commons in the barracks became alive with people doing everything. Shoemakers, uh, 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 tailors uh, working with thread and needle, uh, bartered uh, for bla black market goods with the civilian workers, jewelers carving uh, marvelous aluminum boxes out of the scrap aluminum to be bartered by the, the, the civilian workers, etc., and most everybody uh, making weapons. I had my own knife, which probably would be called a stiletto, a, a hacksaw blade honed weeks, night after night, week after week with uh, a stone until it was properly uh, shaped. Uh, so that when in, on the uh, uh, 1st of April, 1945, when the order came to vacate the camp, uh, the younger people wanted to revolt. They thought that we, we had enough uh, weapons and people to overpower the guards who were really not, not, not that they were not SS, they were not Wehrmacht. They were, uh, they were uh, reservists in their 40s, 50s, and sometimes 60s who were brought in to, to guard us. But anyhow, that fraction didn't win. 11th day march to Auschwitz. Uh, and this was a death march. A death march to Auschwitz. Uh, probably half of the people uh, died in the march. Uh, we arrived at Auschwitz on the 10th. It was a very strange place. First thing I could, I could tell by the descriptions from the others who had been there, first thing I looked for was the chimney of the crematorium. It wasn't smoking, so that was a good sign. Uh, both gates were open, so there was no quarantine, no expectation to for a long time you retention. Had, you had your arm broken at that time. I had you? my arm broken, yeah. Well, things like that happened on the, on the walk. Uh, and it was broken not because you fell, you were yep, struck I, I, by a uh, guard, yep, right? I, I lost my cool and spoke, talked back to the guard and he hit me with his rifle. But anyhow, to close it up, we, I can't tell you anything about witness, uh, witness reporting on the liberation of Buchenwald, which was quite exciting because I plopped into a, into a bunk and the following day somebody woke me up and uh, called me to, to go up to the fence because the Americans were there. And they were liberated at that point. And they were liberated, yep. Steve, in the, the time we have left before we turn to our audience for some questions, um, how did you get reunited with your sister and then, and then with your uh, father? Both of us separately made the same decision, <coughs> give, giving up our displaced person status and having ourselves repatriated to the other side of the Iron Curtain. Because Back to Subotica. Yeah, because Churchill's speech was in 47, but the Iron Curtain was there in 45. And first day of liberation, uh, first three days of the liberation, the French, the Belgians, the Norwegians, uh, the Greeks, uh, the Spaniards were all out. Those of us who wanted to go to the other side, waited months. So it wasn't till mid-July that I got home. Uh, a week later, I missed my sister coming home. Because a, a well, well-meaning uh, farmer family decided to take me in to fatten me up. <laughs> the result of that, that was, uh, was jaundice. Because the liver was so overloaded. So I wasn't there when she came back. Uh, as I said, a month later, my father was carried in by, by the local firemen. That was the biggest shock. Uh, getting back the factory was important. Was, uh, he was threatened that he would be tried for, uh, for collaboration with the enemy because he did not put up armed resistance when the enemy came. That was the threat if he tried to get back his yep. business. Right. So slowly we built things up and then he passed away, at least at least we could give him a decent burial. 
next to his brother. Okay. His name, my mother's name, and all the other people who perished. Uh, uh, this very elaborate, very smooth tombstone and this ugly hammered in uh, names uh, uh, by hired hands. Uh, and it's, it just grates on me when I think of it. So then we decided life in Yugoslavia was not worth it. Our two cousins, their two fiancés, my sister and I, uh, four or, uh, six of us escaped five different ways in an 18-month period and met up in Paris. And after two and a half years, the uh, Yugoslav, since I lost my displaced person status, I had to come in with the quota, which w was reopened in 1950 after having been closed down in 41. And that's when we came to the States. So it was, it was five years after the war before you got to the United States. Yes. And you and your sister came together? Yes. Did you know anybody here? Yes, there were uh, several people in, in uh, New York as well in Chicago who knew my par uh, parents, who several of whom, uh, my parents helped on their way uh, out. Uh, so yes, we had, we had very good support. Un Steve, until I met Norma and, then, and okay. then I didn't need their support anyway. Um, the, I, I do want to ask you, um, as we mentioned in the introduction, you recently, 2014, published a book about your mother, The Life and Art of Clara Garib. What has it meant to you to, to write that book? And tell us about that. Well, it, it was, my sister and I talked about it a long time. Uh, I eventually undertook it because my two daughter-in-laws threatened that they would do it themselves. And, and that, that I wouldn't let them do it. Uh, collecting things together that had been by then dispersed to the, uh, uh, through the family. Uh, writing a blurb about each. Uh, uh, it was a very, uh, very uh, emotional experience. I, I, you know, at, at one point I had a, a version that the family turned down because I turned myself into a instant art critic and do, did art critiques on the individual pieces and that was uh, totally inappropriate. Uh, yeah, it, it was a very moving uh, experience. I've not only, uh, I have a copy of your book, I've seen some of the original artwork that your mother did, they're fabulous. They're fa she was an extraordinarily yeah. talented artist. Steve, um, ready for a few questions? Yes, sure. We, we, we have time for a few questions, and we're going to start first with taking questions from our web audience on Twitter. Then we'll turn to you folks, our live audience in the auditorium, to see if you have any questions. While we take our first question from Twitter, um, I'm going to ask that anybody that would like to ask Steve a question in the audience, if you wouldn't mind making your way to one of the two microphones uh, so that you're you know, ready to be turned to, I'll ask you that when we call on you, if you will make your question as brief as you can, and then I'll repeat the question so everybody, including Steve, hears the question before he responds to it. Um, so if you wouldn't mind doing that, you know, we'll, we'll take as many as we can in the, in the time we have remaining. So let's take our Twitter question, which from Alan Peaceman. How did Stephen react when he heard about the genocide at Srebrenica? And I'm not saying that correctly. Trebrenica. Did it bring back memories? Uh, it was very difficult to accept that first in the Bosnian War and then later in the Kosovo War in the country that one time I considered my home country that these atro atrocities were repeated. Uh, uh, very difficult to accept and, and very painful. And uh, I, I agonized a lot about it. Uh, I, I must admit I also agonized about the portion, uh, some part of the severity of the Allied response, but not so much in the Bosnian War, but in the, in the Kosovo War. The, the, 
the bridge over the Danube that was blown up by bombardment by uh, NATO forces. Uh, first of all, was designed by the father of a good friend of mine. Second, it, it was a rural bridge. It, it didn't provide any uh, tactical or logistical support and things like that. The erroneous bombing of the of the Chinese embassy. Uh, some some of the uh, those events bothered me. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. We're going to turn now to our live audience, and I'll start with the gentleman here on my left. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Fenvis, uh, sorry to hear of your tragedies, of uh, what you've gone through. But, sir, I would like to thank you for serving in our U.S. Army as a veteran to the United States. Thank you very much for your service, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, that was the time of the draft. I did not volunteer. <laughs> of, of, the, of the welcome that I received in arriving to the United States, nothing was warmer and the welcome from the selective service. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so you know, I did it because I had pledged that I intended to take this, my citizenship and that's, that's what it took. If, if you wouldn't mind me just adding a little piece, Steve, if my memory's correct, of course, with all your language skills, you thought you'd be very valuable in intelligence services, but because you were not yet a US yeah. citizen, you couldn't yeah. do that. They sent, uh, 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 they, the Army did a lot, of, lot for me. Uh, I passed all the uh, language tests. They sent me to Europe, stationed in Stuttgart with an intelligence uh, uh, unit. Uh, they decided they didn't, couldn't clear me. The officer who spoke to me was very kind. He said, uh, you look a little bit, in cases like that, we send you back to infantry. You look a little bit more intelligent than that. What else can you do? I said, well, sir, I also passed my draftsman test and I'm studying to be an engineer. And so I got a position in, in the engineer section at Seventh Army Headquarters in Stuttgart. And, and pretty soon I was chief draftsman. So the first time in my life, I was responsible for other people's work. I got out, got the GI Bill, we got married. We bought our first house on the GI loan. Uh, I have no regrets and no qualms whatsoever about uh, the, the Army experience. Plus the immersion in American Morse language, et cetera, that basic training provides. That, that was <laughs> I'm sure you could share some stories with us yes, about definitely. that. We're going to turn to a young woman over here. Hi, Mr. Stevens. Um, I was wondering if, like, the Polish couple you talked about and the other couples that you talked about that helped you get out of the places, did you keep in contact with them? Did you talk to them? Do you know who they are? The question was, uh, yeah. uh, do you keep in touch with anybody who helped no, you? No, absolutely no. Uh, I made a couple attempts at the, with the uh, Auschwitz uh, Museum run by the Polish government. I remembered some verbal name mm -hmm. in Poli uh, written Polish. It's, I, I mean, I could never produce a name on which they could do a search. The same, the same uh, for everybody else. I've, uh, the, the little camp uh, in Nieder Rochelle it was a, is a little bit better I didn't make any personal contacts, but a person there organized a small local museum, uh, has interviewed every survivor that he can, he could, and he has a book out consisting of interviews of, with people, so I know a little bit about some of those people. But otherwise, no. I mean, the, disin the emptying of the camp in Buchenwald, there was no way of maintaining any, co any, any contact. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one more quick question. We have uh, you here in the pink. Oh, 
Hi, Steve. My name's Annette. Um, I was just wondering how you um, possibly like forgive, you know, and move on. You know, is it a decision that you made? Um, does it help talking about your experiences and sharing those with um, people? Uh, the question is, Steve, how you were able to get to a position where you wanted to live and continue on and... Um, can I look here? Yes, I think I got that. Okay. And does it help for you to talk and do what oh. you're doing today? Well, you know, once once I made this transition from from being close to a living dead to a purpose and a expectation of living, uh, after that transition, you know, I was determined that I would survive. That determined that I would help other people survive, uh, and that. That came very easy. Uh, to the point where, and then, then all kinds of things. Uh, uh, moving to France, learning French, passing that incredible French baccalaureate exam that I don't wish on anybody else. Uh, coming to, uh, to learning, coming to the States, learning English, ar uh, army service, uh, co college, marriage, children, etc. To the point that if I thought about it at all, I thought in the third person, as if that had happened to someone else. And then it was only in the early 70s when I had some problems at work, and I thought that it would be helpful to that I thought that there may have been some connection between that and what I'd experienced in the camps. And that's, that's where I forced myself to talk, first to an uh, uh, a, uh, adult education class in our temple, that's Norma said, hiding behind a heavyset person, and that's where she heard the story the first time. The rabbi asked me to repeat it to the youth group of the older kids were there. That's the first time they heard the whole story. And that from then on, I went to this meeting where some horrible clashes occurred and the only solution was to volunteer to be the founding president. <laughs> and and uh, then other things happened. So from then on, it was very normal. But in terms of uh, any catharsis, any expectation of uh, Additional insight gain? No, definitely not. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. We, um, we're, when Steve finishes, we're going to close the program in just a moment. I know there's a gentleman who had, didn't get a chance to ask a question. When we finish, Steve is going to stay on the stage, so please feel free to come up here and chat with Steve if you want to, or just say hello or uh, shake his hand, so please do that. Um, we want to thank all of you for being here, and our audience is listening on the Internet. Uh, we will have programs each Wednesday and Thursday until mid-August, so even if you can't come back to the museum, there's going to be programs that you'll be able to get off the Internet, um, including today's program. It's our tradition, before you go, hold it, hold it, hold it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's our tradition at first person that our first person gets the last word to close our program, so I'll, close, I'll turn to Steve to do that now. Thank you. I had expected that the last questioner would would lead to, uh, with that question because I get it so often. Question of why am I doing this? As you can tell, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. Uh, today I kept my cool a little bit more than I normally do. But you know, I, I, I break out somewhere along the line. Sometimes it's, it's almost totally unconnected. But anyhow, I do it because I have feel this obligation as a survivor, as a witness, to, to do it, to speak for those who didn't make it, to speak on the topics that this museum is dedicated to, to make sure that people are aware how uh, discrimination, uh, uh, social friction, racial friction can lead to bigger and worse things and to do whatever I can to 
inculcate in some of you the need to resist that temptation and the need to be vigilant that uh, not just that the Holocaust doesn't happen, but that discrimination and, uh, and intolerance doesn't get to the point where, frankly, I think it's getting in some of the presidential rallies. Thank you, Steve. 